The guy who invented the world's first video game also worked on the Manhattan Project. The internet says it's true. Hey, welcome to The Internet Says It's True, where every week we learn something that sounds like I made it up, but it's really true. Part of the WCBE podcast experience. My name is Michael Kent. This is episode 152. I'm currently on the road, so this is a rewind episode. But with the recent blockbuster release of the Oppenheimer film, I thought I'd revisit an episode that we did that made mention of the Manhattan Project. I haven't done any episodes about Barbie, or else these next two weeks would be Barbenheimer companion episodes. Anyway, I want to thank those of you who have joined the Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Michael Kent, and that's where you can become a tizzitor, which is my term for a regular listener to the show and a supporter. Lots of fun stuff there. I'd also encourage you to leave some feedback about the podcast by rating and reviewing it on Apple Podcasts. That helps me a ton because it gets more listeners and it just helps me climb the charts and get more people listening to the podcast. Now, this episode was one of the first ones we ever did. Episode number seven, all the way back on November 2nd of 2020. So you'll notice the format is slightly different because I was just sort of finding my way as a podcaster. I hope that you enjoy this look back. Today's topic comes from Peru in what? In India? That's awesome. Hi, my name is Puru from Delhi. I recently learned that the man who made the world's first video game was also a member of a team which made the world's first nuclear bomb. He said he recently learned the person who made the world's first video game also was on the team that made the world's first nuclear bomb. Whoa. Now, I'm pretty sure the first video game was Pong. My dad had this Atari 2600 that my brother and I would play in the, in the basement, and that was long before Nintendo. Let's take a look. Okay, it looks like I'm wrong. Apparently, the first video game was not Pong. It was Tennis for Two in 1958. I'm curious. Let me look on YouTube for Tennis for Two. Let's see if we can find somebody playing it. So, there's no actual sound to the video game itself, just the loud clicking of controllers. And it's really interesting, because unlike in Pong where it's a top-down view, it's a side view of a tennis match, as if you were the judge sitting at the net. Let's get into the history of this. William Alfred Higginbotham was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1910. He got an undergraduate degree in Williamstown, Massachusetts at Williams College in 1932. Then he continued his education at Cornell in New York. Later, in 1941, he worked with MIT scientists to develop a radar system. It's here that we're going to skip forward in time a bit. Don't worry, we'll get back to these lost years later in the episode. But in 1958, Higginbotham, who was known as Willie, was the head of the instrumentation division at the Brookhaven Institute. Now, Brookhaven would hold an open house for visitors every year in the fall. And being a science lab, most of their work was dealing with flowcharts, endless stacks of paper, and the occasional photograph. Higginbotham wanted to capture the imagination and the attention of visitors in the lab. He wanted people to realize that the science they were doing at Brookhaven had a real relevance to society. That's when he remembered something he had read in the manual for their new Donner Model 30 computer. The computer was capable of calculating ballistic missile trajectories and displaying that information on an oscilloscope. An oscilloscope was this off-white box with a few knobs and a tiny round 5-inch screen for displaying graphical values. Willie Higginbotham had an idea. What if that screen could be used to interact in real time with input controls and be used for amusement rather than just displaying test data? What he came up with was a game with two controllers that would input live data. It took him, along with fellow engineers David Potter and Robert Dvorak Sr., four hours to design and two weeks to build the project. The controller was just a giant silver box. On top of the box were two controls. On the left, a big black dial, and on the right, a black momentary contact push button. The circuitry of the game involved resistors, capacitors, and relays 
with transistors aiding in the fast switching of the graphics. And I'll put a link to the circuit drawing in the show notes so you can see that for yourself. And these controlled a bright white ball with a trail on the screen that could be played back and forth over a line symbolizing a tennis net. There was no score, there was no obvious start or stop to the game, but people loved it. It soon became so popular with visitors to Brookhaven, they would line up outside of the lab just to play the game, which he called Tennis for Two. People loved it so much, Higginbotham brought it back the following year with improvements to allow players to change the gravity effect on the ball, simulating being able to play tennis on Mars or Jupiter. While many consider this the world's first video game, I should mention that there are competing claims from others. There's a cathode ray tube device from 1947. There's also a light bulb based game called Birdie the Brain. And there was also a tic-tac-toe type game by A.S. Douglas called OXO. And to determine who was the first video game, it really depends on how you define video game. I would say that Tennis for Two bears the closest resemblance to what followed in the 70s Pong, which as we know, launched the idea of console gaming and created an industry. What's more interesting about Willie Higginbotham's story, however, is that prior to his pioneering video games, he helped pioneer something much more powerful. And we'll get into that after I tell you a little bit about our sponsors. I'm John DeSando, host of Back Talk. This podcast is an extension of the long-running, award-winning movie review show, It's Movie Time. Back Talk features additional content and banter with guests about new movies. If you want more insight and information about what's playing now in theaters and online, find Back Talk at the WCBE Podcast Experience on wcbe.org. You'll be happy you did. There was a time that humans used 100% organic products as healing balms and moisturizers for their skin. Well, I've partnered with an awesome company that wants to get back to those times. Fatco sells organic and responsibly made tallow-based skincare products. For centuries, humans used tallow in skin moisturizers and healing balms, but unfortunately, the topical application of these fats seemed to stop around the same time that animal fats stopped being considered part of a healthy diet. A lot of modern skincare products do more harm than good by stripping your skin of its natural oils. Let's change that. You can try them out now at fatco.com and get 15% off your order by using my promo code INTERNET. Go to the internet says it's true.com slash deals for the link. If you love listening to this podcast every week and you want to show your support, that would mean a great deal to me. You can do that by becoming a Patreon member. We've got members at all levels, whether you want to pledge $1 a month or $10 a month. Just think about the value that you receive from this show. And if you like the histories and the stories that you learn about or the jokes that you hear, and if you think that they're worth it, consider signing up. For that, you get every episode ad-free and a week early, access to bonuses like the unedited videos of the guest appearances, and 20% off all merchandise. You can sign up today at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. That's patreon.com slash Michael Kent. So we skipped over what Higginbotham spent most of his career on. Hint, it wasn't a video game. That was simply a distraction, a way of getting people excited about the lab. His real life revolved around the development of nuclear weapons. In the later years of World War II, he worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico, and his team was instrumental, pardon the pun, for developing the electronics that made the first atomic bomb possible. It would come to be known as the Manhattan Project. They created the complex ignition mechanism and developed the tools to measure the testing of the bomb. The entire time, Higginbotham was conflicted about being involved with something capable of so much destruction. He determined that it was okay for him because he, quote, was anxious to make sure that what he did would contribute to ending the war, end quote. On the 16th of July in 1945, Willie Higginbotham and several other scientists witnessed a test detonation of the first atomic bomb. The radio communications to allow the team to monitor the test were created by Higginbotham. Less than a month later, 
the first atomic bomb was dropped over Hiroshima. His reluctance to be a part of the destructive power of nuclear weapons continued after the war. He had lost two brothers in the war. He didn't want to see more nuclear bombs causing death and destruction. He personally helped found the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Group Federation of American Scientists and was its first chairman. Their activities included lobbying Washington, testifying at official government hearings, and presenting lectures about the dangers of a nuclear arms race. These efforts had an important effect on slowing the spread of nuclear weapons. They helped pass the May Johnson Bill, the McMahon Atomic Energy Act, and helped establish the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. So now we've learned something new about Willie Higginbotham, a mild-mannered engineer from Connecticut who held over 20 patents. He helped create something that he later feared and unwittingly helped create a video game industry that's worth over $100 billion today. It is time for the part of the podcast where I call a friend and see if they already know what we just talked about. Today, we're going to call a magician friend of mine, Nick Lacapo. I've only ever known Nick as a fellow magician, but I was chatting with last week's guest, Eric Tate, and Eric told me something I didn't know. Nick is not only a video game aficionado, but he was sort of accidentally one of the pioneers of internet-based gaming. Hey, what's up, dude? There he is. What's up, man? I was talking with Tate... And he said that you have a former life as a video game developer. I had no idea about this. Uh, I know yeah, you man. as a magician. And um, tell me a little bit about what you used to do. Well, it all just kind of happened for chance. I got scouted by Lycos.com. Do you remember Lycos? I don't. <laughs> right? At one point, Lycos was one, one, two, and three top websites on the internet. This is before Google, when the search engines that you would come across would be Lycos. Uh, MSN and Yahoo, those were like the three big three, and they would just swap positions as to who was the best. So Lycos had this like uh, division where they were looking for young talent. You remember AIM profiles, right? Yeah. AOL. Sure. It's the messenger. And then that's where you'd put like the stuff in your, your info. Absolutely. Yeah. So we made a site that was, to my research up to this point, like among the first uh, viral marketing video game sites. Think Farmville, think um, like Mafia Wars. Are you familiar with these games? Yeah. Okay. My game was the originator of all of that. And that's just because we were stupid and we were like, you know, it'd be fun. Let's make a vampire thing where you, you sign up and you get a, you get a special link. And then the way that the game will work is if you can trick your friends to clicking on it, you'll get a point. Right. And then it that page that they land on will then try to convert that person into creating a vampire. And then we'd give out a monthly prize of at the time it was like a PlayStation two or a Spider-Man two DVD. I think that was one of the first prizes to kind of jump ahead. We just kind of dove in, got an office and then started developing this into a more robust game, which came to be known as Outwar, which still exists. It's O-U-T-W-A-R, Outwar.com. Let me get straight into one of the quiz type questions. Do you know anything about the first video game ever created? Uh, well, if you mention it, I might, but like, because <laughs> uh, like if, you, if, the, if the question is, what is it? Not, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know this either. This is, you know, the, the, the topic of the, the idea of the podcast is me learning things that I didn't previously know. Sure, and if you sure. would have asked me what was the first video game, I would have said Pong. I would yeah, have just like, guessed, you know, Atari 6400. Like tank one, but yeah. Yeah, so it goes way before that. It goes back to 1958. Uh, and mm. there was this guy that created a game that was called Tennis for Two. Ooh. But there huh. are competing claims. And had a game like yours, where it's a tech, it started as a text-based game, been around, I'm curious if that would have been able to compete for the title of the first video game. Because some of the some of the competing claims for the first game against Tennis for Two are things like there was a tic tac toe game, there was mm. a a game where the user interacted with a computer, but the readout was not on a screen; it was using light bulbs. 
Hmm. So you know what I mean. Hmm. So is that technically yeah, a video so like game? What, what is what is it a video game really? Yeah. yeah do you have uh, a personal definition of what what would be a video game to you? I would say that even the one with the light bulbs would be a game. If, if, I, I guess it's just the medium, right? Like if it's not me and you in the same room. Yeah, I guess it depends on what you're up against, right? Is that yeah. is that really the core? Is, I, are you up I, against the computer or another exactly. person? Exactly. So yeah, to me, I think that a screen is a part of because it comes down to the word sure, video. A screen, like what yeah. is a video? And to a me, video? a video sort of has to be has to involve a screen. However, this first the one that we're talking about in this episode was an oscilloscope. Yeah. Which was a yeah, five yeah. inch circle that looks like mm-hmm. something you would it was developed to to map missile trajectories it's it wasn't made for this and the result was that people were lining up around the building to play this what makes a video game catch on what is the thing that a video game has to have to make people want to come back and play it again you know the the, the, a popular term going around right now is the whole slot machine idea that places like facebook and instagram and all that stuff use and video games use them as well i mean they're they, the, the way that their designers design the levels and the systems within the game to um, keep you playing. Like, what's a good example? Farmville is just a never-ending, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, mess of, 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 oh, actually, I'm not very familiar with Farmville, but I know that it just, it's a snowball effect, right? Where you, the more you put in, the more you get, and the more you infect your friends. And the Explain more to that, me what you mean by slot machine. I'm, I have, I'm not familiar with that term as it pertains to video games. Oh, well, slot machines are addictive. Sure. Right, because you pull the lever and it, uh, and it lights up and it, and it has all the fun sounds. And, and then if you win, oh, man, do you, you ever play slot machines? <laughs> you get out I, of the I, house much? <laughs> I don't. N- neither. Uh, <laughs> no, you know, I, I have played, I very rarely have ever played slot machines. I will, really? I'll play a video poker. I'll play blackjack. I'll play roulette. But I very rarely will play slot machines. Um, Which is another video game, in a sense. Totally, uh, totally. A lot of them, the video boards that are on them are basically a game. You just, mm-hmm. you know, it's just a random generation. So you're just pulling that lever. Systems like that, that are designed to give you a rush, uh, are probably one of the biggest reasons that people replay a game. Um, I'm trying to think of like, you know, not these days, it's a lot to do with the way that people look in the game. You know, there's all these cool like outfits um, and symbols of prestige. Those are things, things that other people can't get, right? You need to get people hooked first. The game has to be good. But once they're in, if the systems within the game yeah. make them play more and more, um, that's what will really help the game. Attaining, attaining game yeah. currency. Yeah. It's yeah. not actual currency. I'm personally addicted to uh best fiends best uh i'm fiends. i'm not i'm best fiends does a lot of podcast sponsorship and it's important that i say i'm not sponsored by them but that's how i learned about best fiends it mm-hmm. is a typical like block breaker type game yeah where you, you're, you're, it's like a, you know matching colors but it's progressive in the way that uh they add rules they add complexity the more it goes and I'm on like level 1700 and something. And I think there are 2,500 levels or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, and it's, it's 100%. Um, I would say it's mindless, but I don't like using that term. I, I would much prefer to say it's meditative um, mm. where like I will literally just play it while I'm watching a TV show and can tell you 100% what's going on with that TV show at the time. But because yeah, I'm yeah. just playing this game and it's automatic, but there is the, there's the attaining of levels. There's mm-hmm. there's the feeling of progress and moving forward through the game. And there's something about those types of games that that speak to like so go back to newspapers back in the day that would put the crossword puzzle and the Sudoku puzzles and stuff in there. The thing that just kind of like makes your brain turn a little bit. Yeah. Like I love to play stuff like that in the morning. Um, I play Hearthstone, which is a little bit more complex, but at the same time, I can play it pretty mindlessly. Yeah. Um, and it just kind of helps, get, at least I think, <laughs> get my brain kickstarted a little bit. It's, it's interesting to me because a lot of the things that we're talking about in terms of like achieving progress through the game, graphics, weren't there for this first game. It was just that it, 
no one had had done anything like this. The idea of interacting with a machine in that way, yeah. I think, was what initially determined people yeah. would 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 keep coming back to it. This has been super interesting. Um, I'm not sure how much it has to do with our story this week, but I don't really care because this is very interesting stuff nonetheless. Um, I think it is really interesting that this guy created something that was nothing. The gameplay wasn't good because it wasn't available to be good. It was nothing mm. but a dial and a button. If anyone ever asks you what the very first video game, one of the contenders, is a game called Tennis for Two by this mm -hmm. guy's name, Willie Higginbotham. <laughs> Willie. Big shout out to Willie. Is he still around? Probably not. Right? No, he died in, uh, I think, 94. 95 something like that he was very old mm -hmm. uh he uh you know he was in crucial to the manhattan project toward the end of world war ii well yeah. i think you know i did i did see there's something on netflix right now the uh, history of video games that is um looks like it's something good I, it's on my queue i haven't watched it yet um so i know that's out there and i but i do think that the whole idea of the history of video games is it just hasn't really been written but I think it's starting to become written. Well, people are just um, now, it, now that it's a hundred billion dollar industry, people are looking yeah. back and saying, it's important that we figure out how this thing got started. And yeah. it was news to me that it got started before Pong because yeah. I thought you Pong know, like, was the first one. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, uh, you know, we're, we come from this strange background of magic tricks, right? Mm -hmm. Where we are like pretty religious about like figuring out who created what and it was yeah. really really important it's like important to just pass that information on video games has none of that right if you were instrumental uh, in like creating a, a a system within a system that no user would even be aware of nobody in the world knows who invented it i mean that guy does wow. and probably the company the studio that they work for does but um but nobody really knows these things uh, it, they're just pieces Things that work are taken and used with no no uh, no permission at all. I don't know that it, there needs to be, but um, yeah, that's just how it works in that. That's really 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 interesting. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me, man. Uh, so, in addition to knowing about the early roots of online video just gaming, a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> Nick is a wonderful magician. Uh, you should check him out. What's your website, Nick? Oh, just you can follow me on Instagram. At Instagram. Nick Lacapo. Yeah. Nick Lacapo. It's N I C K L O C A P O. Nick Lacapo. Uh, check him it. out there. And yep. uh, yeah, man, it's good to see you. And, and thanks for joining. Yeah, good to be seen. That's all for this week. I want to take a quick second for a message of gratitude. Other than a small amount of money from our sponsors, which I so greatly appreciate. I do this podcast for free, and that's why I'm so grateful for my Patreon subscribers. We've got a great community building there, and I put lots of bonus content up on there. And as far as this podcast is concerned, there's already three or four hours worth of bonus content on Patreon. Whenever we do an interview for the show, I post the unedited raw interview up there. And oftentimes there's a lot of great stuff that's super interesting that gets cut for time. So thank you to those of you who have taken a moment to join at Patreon. I have membership levels starting at $1 a month, and you can join at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. I do understand that times are tight for a lot of people right now. So if you enjoy this podcast and you want to support it, but it's just not the right time financially, I completely understand that. Trust me. Uh, something you can do that doesn't cost a penny is to review the podcast on iTunes with a little bit of verbiage because writing a few words helps a ton to allow other people to listen. The internet says it's true. We'd like to thank the Patreon subscribers whose monthly contributions help to make this show possible. Sean Brown, Joshua Endress, Dallas Ray, Bryce Swanson, Eugene Anderson, Jim and Joanne Martin, Mitch and Andrew Joseph Kemplin, and the show's official emperor, Kick Track. The show is written and produced by me, Michael Kent. The theme song is by Finite Music Forge, and all audio clips in this episode are used for education and commentary and used under Fair Use Title 17 USC Section 107. You can listen to past episodes by searching for The Internet Says It's True wherever you get your podcasts, and you can see bonus content at patreon.com slash Michael Kent.